Our Bible study this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 3. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 3, in just verses 1 to 3. Verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Amen. We've seen already how Matthew has narrated the birth of Jesus and the events surrounding that birth. Matthew now moves ahead to the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus. We know very little about the youth of Jesus. It's not recorded in the Gospels, and it has not been revealed to us, apart from really that one incident that we find in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. I'm sure you know the account, how Joseph and Mary went up to Jerusalem for the Passover, and Jesus, being about 12 years old at that point, went with them. And then later on, when Joseph and Mary were leaving Jerusalem, they thought that Jesus was still in the company, perhaps with one of their relatives. And only later on did they discover that he was not, in fact, with them at all. And so they turned back to Jerusalem to look for him. And they found him in the temple, speaking with the doctors or the teachers, listening to them, asking them questions. Everyone was amazed at his learning, his wisdom. And when Mary said to Jesus, what are you doing? Didn't you know that your father and I would be looking for you? Jesus responded, wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Of course, when Jesus spoke of his father, he was not talking about Joseph. He was talking about God, the Father. Now that one incident is enough to show us that all his life, Jesus was acting in his role as our mediator. Not once did he step out of that plan of redemption. Not once did he deviate from the redemptive design and purpose of God. From beginning to end, his life was perfect, complete submission and obedience to the will of the Father. That, I think, is an important point for us to keep in mind, even as we pass over those years and come to the point, as Matthew narrates it, when Jesus is about to begin his public ministry. It doesn't mean that for those years before his public ministry, Jesus was doing nothing. No, every moment of his life, he was working and living for us, for you and for me, so that we might be saved. But Matthew focuses on this public ministry, as indeed all the Gospel writers do. And Matthew begins his narration of this public ministry, as all the Gospel writers do, not straight away with the Lord Jesus, but with John the Baptist. And these first three verses of Matthew chapter 3 give us a general picture of the ministry of John the Baptist. And I think it's good for us to spend a little bit of time considering these things. There's a reason why all the Gospel writers begin with John the Baptist, with the ministry of John the Baptist, as leading up to the ministry of Jesus. John is an important figure. He sets the stage, really, historically and spiritually, for the public ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, there are three things in particular for us to consider from these three verses. First of all, we want to say something about the man himself, John the Baptist. You can see a little bit of that in verse 1. and We'll refer to the other Gospels, especially the Gospel of Luke, to flesh that out. Then we want to say something about his message. And we see that, or a summary of that, in verse 2. Finally, we want to say a few words about his ministry, the, the general character of it, the overall purpose and aim of it. And we see that in verse 3. So three things for us to consider from these three verses. The man, his message, and his ministry. First of all, the man himself, John the Baptist. Who was he? Now in Matthew's account, this is the first time that we hear of the name John the Baptist. 
Luke is the one really who tells us a good deal more. John the Baptist was born to the priest, Zacharias, and his wife, Elizabeth. It was a miraculous birth. Elizabeth was barren. Zacharias evidently had been praying for a child, and this prayer was answered. And this child, John, was to be consecrated to a special purpose. He was to be filled with the Spirit from the womb for that purpose. And what exactly was that purpose? He was sent by God to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. He was sent to prepare the way for the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, John was related to Jesus. Elizabeth was Mary's cousin. We read that in Luke chapter 1. And interestingly, the name itself, John, was also significant. If you look at Luke chapter 1 and verse 59, you see this interesting incident recorded. Luke chapter 1 verse 59, earlier on, when the angel appeared to Zacharias, the angel told Zacharias that the child was to be named John. But at the birth of the child, or on the eighth day when it came time to circumcise the child, there was talk of naming the child Zacharias after his father. So here in Luke chapter 1, verse 59, It came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they called him Zacharias after the name of his father. And his mother answered and said, Not so, but he shall be called John. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. And he asked for a writing table. Zacharias had been struck dumb because he did not believe the message that was conveyed to him by the angel. He asked for a writing table and wrote, saying, His name is John. And they marveled all. Now, when something like that is recorded, it is evident that there is some amount of emphasis being placed on the name. And so the name is something significant. It's not something irrelevant. It was something, in fact, chosen by God, communicated to Zacharias and to Elizabeth. This child will be called John. So what what does the name mean? Well, the name John, we are told, comes from the Hebrew, and it means the Lord is gracious. And we can see immediately how appropriate this name is. This child was really a representative of the grace of God. This child was sent by the grace of God for a gracious purpose. This child, through this child, God was visiting, in fact, his people with that gracious purpose. And this this is something that Zacharias himself spoke of, prophetically filled by the Spirit. Luke chapter 1 again, this time verse 68. Zacharias, filled with the Holy Ghost, prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. This is a time of consummation of God's gracious purpose. This has been spoken of by the mouth of the holy prophets since the world began. Everything has been pointing to this moment. And this child, John, comes as the herald of the final fulfillment of these prophecies. Truly, the Lord is gracious. And we are told in Luke chapter 1, verse 80, that the child, John, grew was and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. But at the appointed time, as Luke tells us later, the word of God came to John in the wilderness. And that is when, going back now to Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist came preaching, preaching in the wilderness of Judea. That is a region from stretching from Judea in the west to Jordan and the Dead Sea in the east, a barren, desolate place, rocky, scrubby. And that in itself, that location is not without significance, as we will see. So much then for the man, 
Very interesting the way that John the Baptist comes on the scene. But what was his message? He came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Preaching what? We'll see more of this later on. Matthew records more of John's preaching in more detail. But he gives us, first of all, this summary in verse 2 of Matthew chapter 3. What did John preach? Basically, he preached repentance. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Repentance signifies that complete transformation of mind and heart. It is a total change of inner attitude, away from sin and towards God. But notice the reason that is given for this repentance. Repent ye. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that's a very significant phrase. The kingdom of heaven. We're going to encounter it a number of times. So it's important for us to try and understand it. What is the kingdom of heaven? Now a kingdom is very simply that domain where a king reigns, as far as his authority stretches, wherever his authority as king is recognized, wherever he as king is accepted and obeyed and submitted to. That's his kingdom. That's the domain over which he rules. The kingdom of heaven, then, refers to the sovereignty and authority of heaven, which is God's sovereignty, God's authority. In that sense, the terms kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are synonymous. It is that realm where God's rule is obeyed and embraced. That's the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is very far from some harsh or cruel conception of rule, that we may have based on our human experience. God's rule, God's kingdom is not like any earthly kingdom. There is no domineering. There is no cruelty. God's authority is nothing like the sinful exercise of human authority. And in fact, from our previous study of Isaiah, we already have a good picture of what this kingdom, what this authority is like. For example, if you look back at Isaiah chapter 2, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1, the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. This is the kingdom established on earth. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That's the kingdom, the law of God going forth. And everywhere it is submitted to, it is obeyed, willingly, cheerfully. The people delight to be under the rule of God, because it is a good rule. Look at verse 4. He shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. It's a good thing when the kingdom of heaven comes to earth. It is a good kingdom. It is a good rule. It is peaceful and perfect authority. And then also, Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. This is the king who rules in that kingdom. 
It is a kingdom of justice, kingdom of law and righteousness, a perfect and a good kingdom. There is no place for evil and wickedness in this kingdom. Verse 6 of Isaiah chapter 11. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. When that happens, when God's rule is submitted to and obeyed everywhere on earth, then there is such peace. There is such perfect peace. The kingdom of God is a good thing. It is something that we delight in. It is something that we want. A kingdom of righteousness and peace. Because everything wicked is excluded. All rebellion is gone. It is a kingdom, in fact, that reflects the attributes of God Himself. That's what it means. The kingdom is like the king. If the kingdom is not like the king, then the king is no king at all. He has no power or authority. The kingdom is like the king because it is the place, the domain, where His authority is accepted and obeyed. And so because God is righteous, because God is just, because God is holy and pure and good, His kingdom is one of righteousness and justice and holiness and purity and goodness. Everything is as it should be in God's kingdom because God's perfect will is perfectly obeyed. Now this is something, this kingdom is something that will only be established in its final fullness in the future because this present world world is a fallen world, populated by fallen creatures like ourselves. And our carnal minds, as Paul tells us in Romans, cannot be subject to the law of God. And if our minds cannot be subject to the law of God, then we cannot be part of His kingdom, can we? We cannot submit to His authority. We cannot accept His dominion and His rule. We are excluded from His kingdom. And yet, here's the wonderful thing. John comes preaching, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the wonderful good news of the message. The kingdom is near, near enough for you to grasp. It's not far off from you. It's near. You can enter it. Fallen creatures like ourselves who should be excluded have this hope that we may enter that perfect kingdom and enjoy that perfect rule. Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the way to enter that kingdom involves repentance. That's what it means here. That's the summary of John's message. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God has brought his kingdom near. You can enter it, but repentance is required. We have to accept the fact of our sin against God, our rebellion against Him. We have to repudiate that rebellion and now turn to Him by faith, pleading for mercy and pardon and forgiveness for our sins. Now again, we have to ask ourselves, in what sense does John come preaching this message now? In what sense is the kingdom of heaven at hand now? Because In a sense, it was always at hand. From the moment of the fall, from the moment when mankind fell in Adam, God Himself preached the first gospel. God Himself gave that hope, the seed of the woman that will crush, bruise the head of the serpent. There will come one in whom man can be saved. There is a hope still of entering the kingdom from which man has now been cast out because of his rebellion. And since that time, the saints of old have entered the kingdom 
by faith. They have been looking, as the Apostle tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, for a better country, a heavenly country. They were looking for that kingdom, and by faith they entered it. But John comes preaching, the kingdom of heaven is at hand because the kingdom is especially near now at this point in time because John comes as the herald of the king himself. The king himself is coming. Now is the appointed time. He arrives on the stage of history to establish and to accomplish, to make open that way to establish that way, to actually accomplish the opening of that way, so that all who come in repentance and faith may enter the kingdom. It is because of him, the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom John the Baptist points, before whom he is sent as herald and forerunner. It is because of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of his work in living and dying for sinners and rising again for our justification, that repentance and faith can lead to salvation. It is because of Jesus that we have anyone to turn to when we turn away from our sins. And because Jesus is about to begin his public ministry, because John is sent to make ready a people prepared for the Lord, he especially comes preaching, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So that is the message, in summary, that John preaches. But why does he preach? What is the overall aim and purpose of his ministry? This Matthew tells us in verse 3 of chapter 3. And Matthew tells us this purpose, this aim, by applying to the ministry of John the Baptist the words of the prophet Isaiah. This is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And this again is a most appropriate application, in light even of the location where John was preaching, the wilderness. This is an application that is in, in line with what was prophesied of John before his birth. Again going back to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 and verse 17, when the angel appeared to Zacharias, this is what the angel said about that child, John. He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, before the Lord, to prepare the way for the Lord, in the spirit and power of Elias, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And then look at verse 76. And thou, child, this is Zacharias, speaking prophetically of his son, John. Thou, child, shall be, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for, shall, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. He will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. That's what Isaiah was speaking of the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And this indeed is something that John himself recognized. If you turn now to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 23. This was the answer of John the Baptist when the Jews sent priests and Levites to ask him, Who are you? John chapter 1, verse 23, he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. John recognized that. He knew that he was coming in fulfillment of that very prophecy. It's not at all inappropriate for Matthew to apply it to his ministry. It was meant to be applied to his ministry. That is really the aim and the purpose of John the Baptist's ministry, to prepare the way of the Lord. Of course, not physically, not by making physical roads in the physical desert, but spiritually by turning the people's hearts 
to repentance. And so John cries in the wilderness, literally, but also figuratively, spiritually, because the people are a wilderness. The people are barren spiritually. The people are dead in their sins, as are we all by nature. But a straight path must be made by repentance, by contrite and humble confession of sin, a straight path so that the Lord may enter our hearts and rule and reign there. John is sent to prepare the way because complacency, pride, self-righteousness, all these things must be cast aside. They are, hin they are hindrances, they are stumbling blocks, they are obstacles. All these must be pushed aside that the way of the Lord might be prepared. If not, if they are not cast aside, then there can be no salvation. Those who are proud, those who are self-righteous, will not humble themselves before God. They will not repent of their sins. They will deny that they are sinners. And how then can they be saved? Those who are complacent, those who don't care about spiritual things, they will not come to Christ. They are allured by the things of the world. The word of God, when it falls upon them, is quickly snatched away, easily snatched away. It does not take root. John is sent to prepare the way. And we'll see later on how his preaching indeed prepared the way. But importantly, notice here that John is sent to prepare the way of the Lord, to make his paths straight. John's ministry was to point the people to Christ, to show them their need of a Saviour, and then to point to that Saviour. Not to take Christ's place, to point to him. This again is something that John recognized very well. Once again, in the Gospel of John, chapter 3. Let me read a few verses from verse 22. This is very interesting. It gives us an insight into the character of John the Baptist himself, his own understanding of his position and place. Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anon, near to Salem, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came to John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, Behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. They sensed a rivalry, a competition. People are going to Jesus to be baptized. Although we are told later on that Jesus himself did not baptize, his disciples baptized. But still, there was baptism taking place there, and more and more people were going there to be baptized. Less and less were going to John the Baptist to be baptized. And his disciples sensed a rivalry. A competition. They came to John with almost, we can call this a complaint. But hear what John answered in John chapter one, verse or John chapter three, verse twenty-seven. John answered and said, "A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom." But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. That's a wonderful testimony, a wonderful example for us. John was sent to prepare the way. And when Christ came, he knew to fade from the scene. He never wanted to draw attention to himself. But he wanted to point everyone to Christ. He must increase. I must decrease. He is the Savior, not me. I am merely the friend of the bridegroom. When I see the bride go to the bridegroom, when I see the people of God go to Christ for salvation, this is my joy. My joy is fulfilled. 
It's not my place to stand in the way or compete. John understood his position very well. He's not the king. He's sent as the herald of the king to prepare the way so that people may go to the king and enter his kingdom. Now we'll go on next time to look at some further details of the ministry of John the Baptist. We have more of this recorded for us by Matthew later on in this chapter. But we can pause here and consider how to apply these things that we have seen to ourselves. And I think this application hinges on the recognition that John the Baptist is not entirely unique. Yes, he was sent by God for a special purpose. Yes, he has a particular role in redemptive history, but he stands in continuity with a long line of those who went before him. Now look ahead briefly to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 in verse 13. Here the Lord Jesus, speaking of John the Baptist, says, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. You remember how Zacharias also said, and God is fulfilling in John what he spoke by the mouth of all the holy prophets that came before since the world began. God is beginning in John to fulfill all of that because John is the herald of Christ who is the fulfillment of those prophecies. But all the law and the prophets prophesied until John. John stands at the head of this prophetic line, all pointing to Christ. Yes, he's the greatest of these, Matthew chapter 11, verse 11. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. He is the greatest of these. By virtue of his position, he stands at the very head of that line pointing to Christ. If you like, he's the tip of the arrow that points to Christ. He's the greatest. But see what the Lord Jesus goes on to say. Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, the second part of the verse. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The new dispensation that has dawned since John the Baptist is greater still. So you see, just as John the Baptist is not unique in relation to the past, but he stands at the head of that long line, so also he is not unique with relation to the future. If you like, he is the head of the one and the tail of the other. And we are part of that whole continuum. We come after John the Baptist, but we can learn from him because of that continuity. And the point is, there is much here in the ministry of John that applies to ourselves. How can we apply what we have seen of the man himself? I think we can apply that to our individual calling. Just think of the way that John came on the scene. God had a special purpose for John, as we have seen. But in his providence, God worked out that purpose through Zacharias and Elizabeth, among others. Just as he did on other occasions. Think of the Old Testament, the example of Samuel, for instance. Another case of a woman who was barren, and God using that, providentially working through that, to bring into this world a child who would be consecrated to his service. God works out his plans through us. He uses a father's prayer, Zacharias. He uses a mother's promise, like Hannah. And he works through these things to accomplish his purposes in the lives of his people and in the world at large. I think that's a good application for us. You and I have our particular individual callings, and God works through us to accomplish His great plan. His work is greater than we can comprehend. We constitute only a small part of it. Even that, even in that, God is gracious to use us. He doesn't need to. But when we are facing trials, when we are facing difficulties, when we're going through distresses, even tragedies, remember God's providence. We can trust that He is working through these, working in ways that we cannot imagine, cannot understand,
cannot now see fully. Now we see so many examples in Scripture. John the Baptist is one of them, of how God works providentially through individual people to bring about the fulfillment of his purposes. Perhaps through this trial, God is moving us to pray, as Zacharias was moved to pray, as Hannah was moved to pray, and so many others. Perhaps God is moving us to pray so that he can work through that prayer. Perhaps he's moving us to accomplish something in another person's life. We cannot see all these threads and connections, but we trust that God is at work and we have our individual calling. And as we are faithful to that, the great plan of God is brought forward. We're not irrelevant. We're not insignificant. In ourselves, we are nothing. But because God has chosen to use, use us, because God has set his grace upon us, we are not insignificant. We have a part to play. We have a responsibility and a privilege. We may not all be preachers like John the Baptist, but we are all part of God's plan. We are all woven into that tapestry. I think that's a great comfort for us as we meditate on it by the help of the Spirit. And then the message of John. Clearly we can apply this to ourselves because we preach the same message. Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's a great temptation these days to water down the message. People don't like the word repentance. It's offensive. It turns people away. But it's necessary. Repentance is necessary because it's true. The fact is that we are sinners. The fact is that our hearts are a wasteland. The fact is that we have rebelled against God, our Creator. We are excluded from His kingdom. The fact is that if we want to enter that kingdom, we have to repent of our sin. We have to put away our rebellions. We have to come contritely, humbly confessing our sins and pleading for mercy and pardon. The way must be prepared, even today. And those who try to preach the gospel without a word of, of repentance, they are not preparing the way. And if the way is prepared, if is not prepared, how can people come to the Lord? If we don't see Christ in light of our own sinfulness, how will we trust in Him for our salvation? His message, John's message, is entirely relevant for us today. The kingdom of heaven is still at hand. Only now we point back to the finished work of Christ as it is recorded for us in Scripture, in the New Testament. It has been done. It has been accomplished. What John came heralding has now been finished by the Lord Jesus. And yet the same urgency applies. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is made near to us now by the finished work of Christ, which we still have to trust in by faith. Repent. Turn to Christ. Now, before it is too late, the kingdom is at hand now. But death comes to us all, disappointed unto man, wants to die, and after that the judgment. And then it is too late. Then the judgment will be that you are excluded from the kingdom forever. Now, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, there is an urgency to the message, both when John preached it and also when we preach the same message today. Then the ministry of John the Baptist. This also applies to us because it reflects our commission. John was sent to the wilderness to preach. John's wilderness was the wilderness of Judea. Our wilderness, if you like, is the whole world. Go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. Yet like John, we are but voices in, the, in that wilderness, pointing to Christ. Our mission, our commission, is to preach Christ. And hearts may be turned to Him, 
that men and women may come to Him in repentance and contrition and find salvation. You and I must learn from the example of John never to get in the way of that by our own pride, self-glory, self-promotion. He must increase. We must decrease. We'll see more of this next time. There's more for us to learn from John, more for us to apply to ourselves. May the Lord help us with what we have already seen as we meditate on it. May He apply it to our hearts by His Spirit, because the world needs John the Baptist today to preach that same message with the same conviction. May the Lord grant that the effect may be as powerful for His glory. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, indeed these are wonderful things that we read in your word, how you brought to pass through the vast complexity of time, yet it is all known to you, every strand, every thread, You know it all. You rule over it all. And in your time, not one moment before or after, John the Baptist came preaching. The Lord Jesus came fulfilling. And now we are sent to preach that same message. We pray that you would help us to recognize our our place as John recognized his. We pray that you would help us to be faithful and diligent as he was. We pray that you would help us to be Christ-exalting and self-abasing as he was. We pray that according to your gracious will, you may use us in whatever position or capacity you have designed to do the work of the kingdom, to bring souls into the kingdom, to advance the kingdom until that glorious day when it dawns finally, fully, forever even as we look for that day when the Lord Jesus will return, we pray and trust that you would help us to do your will and to preach Christ. All these things we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus and for his sake. Amen.